Warning, this episode of Nameless contains some disturbing imagery and mentions of sexual assault and may not be for everyone. Viewer discretion is advised. In the approaching spring of 1992, along the vast stretches of interstate snaking through the Wyoming wilderness, the melting snow revealed the body of an unidentified, murdered woman near Bitter Creek. Over a month later, the body of another woman appeared. Investigators eventually made a chilling connection between the cold cases, and both women, along with their killer, have remained nameless for 26 years. Sunday, March 1st, 1991, approximately 4.30 p.m. Truck driver Barbara Leverton pulls over at the Bitter Creek turnout just off the westbound lane of Interstate 80 to switch fuel tanks. Sipping her coffee in the falling temperatures, she notices down an embankment a short distance away in the melting snow what looks like a trash bag. The shape of the bag unsettles her. Something about the curve, she says, draws her closer. Upon further inspection, she realizes she's looking at the face-down, nude body of a woman, partially buried in the melting winter snow. Barbara immediately radios her fellow drivers, telling someone to forward the info to law enforcement. Not long after, Sheriff Gary Bailiff and several other officers arrive. Authorities determine the woman was likely dumped from the top of the hill, possibly from a vehicle, and rolled down the embankment where she rested and was covered by snowfall, concealed until the spring thaw. Monday, March 2, 1991. County Coroner Michael Vase begins the autopsy on the unidentified woman, now called Bitter Creek Betty. Her body was well-preserved from the snow, and Vase determined she was 24 to 32 years old, with dark brown or black collar-length hair and dark brown eyes. They thought she was possibly, quote, white with predominantly Hispanic characteristics or Hispanic with native characteristics, end quote. However, later DNA Parabon snapshot phenotyping and ancestry kinship analysis revealed she was of European and South American descent. Most agencies list her as either Native American or Hispanic. Standing at approximately 5 feet 8 inches tall, Betty weighed 125 to 130 pounds and had a vertical cesarean scar on her abdomen in addition to a 1 inch scar on her left calf. Her teeth showed signs of dental work, but without a name to go with her face, her most distinguishable feature was a tattoo of a rose on her right breast. At this point, some investigators came to know her as Rose Doe. Though she was found nude, she wore two pieces of jewelry, a gold-colored necklace and a plain gold-colored wedding-type ring on her left ring finger. Near her body, detectives also found a pair of sweatpants and pink underwear that possibly belonged to the victim. The coroner confirmed law enforcement's suspicions that Doe had gone undiscovered for months, estimating her time of death from one to five months prior, between late 1991 through early 1992. Unfortunately, Rose Doe's fate wasn't painless or accidental. There were signs of sexual assault, strangulation, and trauma to the face and jaw. The final blow was calculated and cold. An ice pick or a similar instrument was inserted into the victim's left nostril, up into her skull where it penetrated her sphenoid bone, resulting in an almost instantaneous death. Now dealing with a homicide, authorities knew the next step was to identify Bitter Creek Betty in hopes of finding her killer. 
Sheriff Bailiff and his officers scoured their department's missing persons reports, checked for a fingerprint match in the National FBI database, and all North American state-level agencies sent a description of her to every major visual media outlet in the United States, as well as a flyer to law enforcement agencies all over the country and the National Crime Information Center. Even after media broadcast Rose Doe's description, sketches, and post-mortem photos, authorities still had few leads. Families called, wondering if Bitter Creek Betty was their missing loved one. But after eliminating 30 possible identities and an additional 40 with the National Crime Information Center, Rose Doe's name remained a mystery. The only concrete clue detectives had was the type O blood at the scene of the body. It didn't belong to Bitter Creek Betty, so authorities concluded it belonged to her killer. It wasn't until after a picture of the rose tattoo aired that authorities got their first break in July of 1992. A tipster recognized the ink's calligraphy signature and told police it belonged to artist Ralph Hawley, who worked out of kick-ass tattoo close to the Triple T truck stop in Tucson, Arizona, about 970 miles south of where Bitter Creek Betty was found. Holly, known to Inc. truckers, recognized the tattoo when authorities contacted him. During his interviews with law enforcement, he recounted the woman came in June of 1991, was Hispanic but lacked an accent, was fairly intelligent, and was a leaper, someone who hitchhiked to her next destination across the country. Holly also remembered she wore a brown peasant dress with yellow flowers. However, the vital piece of information he couldn't remember was her name, which he couldn't recall even under hypnosis. Something I want to mention is that one report by the APB News seemed to imply the entire account was given under hypnosis, but in other reports of the recounting, if hypnosis is mentioned at all, it is in regards to trying to find out Doe's name, not the entire account. Um, I couldn't find which parts of the account authorities consider good information, What I can tell you is the info that appears on the official FBI website is that she was tattooed at this location in Tucson. With their investigation and evidence, police speculated Bitter Creek Betty was likely killed elsewhere before being dumped where she was found, sometime between October 1991 and February of 1992. Unfortunately, the case faded from the local papers, media, and many minds altogether, but Law enforcement couldn't forget when, just over a month after Rose Doe was found, they had another nameless homicide victim on their hands. Monday, April 13th, 1992. 43 days after Rose Doe's body was discovered. State Highway Department workers and Sheriff Bob Shelley come across a female body down an embankment off the southbound lane of I-90 in Sheridan County, just five miles south of the Wyoming-Montana border. The sheriff knew of Rose Doe's case in the southern part of the state, and at first, detectives didn't think the two incidents were related. However, later evidence challenged that notion. Forensic specialists and investigators faced more of a challenge with Sheridan County Jane Doe. The decomposition was far enough along her features were unrecognizable. Her eye color couldn't be determined, but forensics did reveal she was 16 to 21 years old, a Caucasian female who weighed approximately 110 to 115 pounds and stood around five and a half feet tall. Her shoulder length hair had straight to wavy texture and was brown and sun bleached, possibly indicating she spent a lot of time outdoors. She'd given birth at least once in her life and the examiner estimated she died approximately a month before she was found, sometime in February of 1992. Jane Doe was found fully clothed, but barefoot. She wore brass, sphere-shaped earrings, a light blue and white checked midriff shirt with false jeweled buttons that tied just beneath the breasts, size 5 to 6 blue jeans, and a wide, white plastic belt with silver-colored buckle. Her undergarments consisted of a light blue lacy bra, size 38C, and a nylon pink paisley-patterned bikini-type underwear. 
The first autopsy couldn't determine a cause of death, but did rule out stabbing, shooting, strangulation, and sexual assault. However, it was later concluded she had died from blunt force trauma to the head, meaning Jane Doe was now their second female victim to turn up on the roadside within the span of months. Sheridan County Jane Doe received even less media attention, but behind the scenes, detectives made a grim connection. DNA found at the site of Jane Doe's body matched the blood type O found at the scene of Bitter Creek Betty's body, indicating both women likely fell victim to the same perpetrator. But without a name for either woman, finding the killer would prove nearly impossible. Both law enforcement and web sleuthers have worked tirelessly to narrow the pool of possible identities for Bitter Creek Betty and Sheridan Jane Doe. One of the resources for unidentified persons is called Name Us, and they recently changed their website format, and it appears they no longer publicly list exclusions. So the only way to find them, as far as I'm aware, is through Web Sleuth Forum Conversations or the Wayback Machine, a website where you plug in a URL, even a broken one, and sometimes get a snapshot someone made of the page when it was a working URL. Between Web Sleuth forums and Wayback Machine captures, I was able to compile a list of exclusions for both Bitter Creek Betty and Sheridan County Jane Doe, though this may not be a comprehensive list as the captures date back to 2016 and late 2017. Anything added after that point wouldn't be visible on the Wayback Machine link. So these women have been ruled out as being Bitter Creek Betty, aka Rose Doe. Tiffany Louise Sessions, who was 20 years old and vanished from Gainesville, Florida in February of 1989. Pamela Sue Dalton, a 34-year-old who went missing on January 1st, 1991 from Sykeston, Missouri. 30-year-old Sherry Bynum, who vanished from Colorado Springs, Colorado on August 9th, 1987. And the Web Sleuth forums added that 21-year-old Don Renee Silvernail from Hubbardston, Michigan, who went missing on November of 1991, had also been ruled out. These women have been ruled out as being the Sheridan County Jane Doe. 15-year-old Kimberly Ann Amaro, who went missing from St. John in New Brunswick, Canada on September 3rd, 1985. 15-year-old Amy Danielle Gibson from Greensboro, North Carolina, who vanished on December 7th, 1990. And finally, Virginia Lynn Uden has been eliminated as being both Bitter Creek Betty and Sheridan County Jane Doe. She was 32 years old when she vanished from Lander, Wyoming in September of 1980. Two decades later, still without answers, law enforcement refuses to stop looking for the names behind the faces. Loy Young, an agent with the Wyoming Division of Criminal Investigation, who is also a part of the cold case unit responsible for Sheridan Doe's case, said the following, Now they can't speak for themselves. We have to speak for them. If we can identify them and lay them to rest properly, maybe give family members who have been wondering about them for 26 years some closure or at least a peace of mind knowing that they're now resting in peace, that's a win regardless. Both women have been buried in Rest Haven Memorial Garden in Rock Springs, Wyoming. They are still nameless, and no suspects have ever been named or arrested in their cases. Bitter Creek Betty was 24 to 32 years old and of South American and European descent. A cesarean scar on her abdomen indicated she'd given birth at one point in her life. She stood at 5 feet 8 inches tall, weighed 125 to 130 pounds, and had dark brown or black collar-length hair, along with dark brown eyes. She also had a 1-inch scar on her left calf and a tattoo of a rose on her right breast that was inked in Tucson, Arizona in June of 1991. Pink underwear and sweatpants were found near her body, and she wore a gold necklace and gold wedding band type ring on her ring finger. She has evidence of dental work and likely died sometime between late 1991 and early 1992. Sheridan County Jane Doe was 16 to 21 years old, Caucasian with evidence she'd also given birth once in her life. 
Standing at 5 foot 5 or 5 foot 6, she was approximately 110 to 115 pounds and had straight to slightly wavy shoulder length hair that was brown and sun bleached. She was found wearing a blue and white midriff tie shirt, a blue lacy bra, pink paisley bikini like underwear, blue jeans, and a large white plastic belt. She wore brass sphere earrings. Fingerprints, dentals, and DNA are available for comparison on both victims according to NamUs. If you have any information on the identity of or the circumstances surrounding Bitter Creek Betty's death, please contact the Sweetwater County Sheriff's Office at 307-352-6720. If you have information on the Sheridan County Jane Doe's death or her identity, you can contact the Sheridan County Sheriff's Office at 307-777-7181. Special thanks to the Patreon family. The names you see on screen are just some of the people who financially contribute to this channel. Whether they are passionate about cases like Rose Doe or Sheridan County Jane Doe, or the other dark content on this channel, their support cannot be overstated. If you are interested in supporting the channel, information is in the description, but even if you only continue to support by watching, even if you only clicked that little subscribe button and do nothing, even if you lurk without commenting, even if you've never bought merch or been a patron, or even if you've been here since the beginning or just joined the community yesterday, thank you. Thank you for giving both Bitter Creek Betty and the Sheridan County Jane Doe a moment of your time, and special thanks to the law enforcement and web sleuthers who keep these cases in the forefront of their minds. And no matter what you choose to believe or what you speculate, I ask you only for respect in the comments below. And though they called them Jane Doe, both women deserve to reclaim their true names and deserve justice for their murders. Thank you for watching the video. Exposure to cases like this is highly important. And to those of you who support this channel by watching, contributing, or buying merchandise, thank you. If you want to see other unsolved cases or dark content, be sure to subscribe to this channel. Stay safe, friends, and have a good night.